Hi, my name is Seth Flaxman from Imperial College London. It is truly an honor to receive this award from Samsung. Today, I'm going to be telling you about statistical thinking in artificial intelligence, lessons from my work on the COVID-19 pandemic. Quick background on me. I'm from the Chicago area in the United States. I did my PhD at Carnegie Mellon University in the School of Computer Science and the School of Public Policy. I moved to Oxford for a postdoc in the Department of Statistics, and now I'm in the Department of Mathematics at Imperial College London. The work that I'm going to be telling you about today would not have been possible without a number of wonderful colleagues, collaborators in both the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology and the Department of Mathematics. We have, over the last six months, produced a number of preprints. Uh, I got involved with the Imperial College COVID-19 response team in March. I'm going to tell you about our work starting with Europe. We put out reports on Italy, two reports and a paper on Brazil, two reports uh, on the United States, both of which are under review. One will be published shortly. Also a very short piece, very readable, uh, reflecting on the first wave of the epidemic, asking the question, have deaths from COVID-19 in Europe plateaued due, due to herd immunity? And I really recommend that you check that out. Uh, it's just two pages. Okay, there are also some websites that accompany this research. Uh, the Europe and the United States websites are no longer being kept up to date. We've been focusing our energy on the United Kingdom. Uh, if you've been following the situation in the United Kingdom, that's for obvious reasons. Here's uh, a couple of weeks ago, we have uh, hotspots of locations, which we define as more than 200 weekly cases reported per 100,000 population. And as you can see, week by week, that spreads. Here now we have our now casts. So there are some regions where we have high probability in pink of more than 200 weekly reported cases. And then going a week into the future, the situation is very worrisome. This is under a no change scenario. Already, local lockdowns have been put into effect. And so we don't expect that the situation will get this bad, at least in places where those lockdowns are currently in place. Here's the plan for my talk today. I'm going to be telling you in detail about some of the statistical and machine learning and computational statistical challenges that we faced in our COVID-19 work. I'm going to tell you about the statistical lessons that we learned in facing those challenges. And then I'm going to tell you about the implications that I see for artificial intelligence more broadly. So why statistics? To me, as a statistical machine learner, I see statistical machine learning and computational statistics as the computational beating heart powering the artificial intelligence revolution. And so the lessons that I have writ small for statistical machine learning, for computational statistics, I think that these lessons apply to the field of artificial intelligence, which of course includes many things beyond machine learning. But I think that these lessons are very important for AI researchers. And I think that they're very pressing for all of us as we think about the challenges that we face as a planet. Okay, so our work, which was released on 30th March, so using data from the beginning of the first wave of the epidemics in Europe, eventually published in June in Nature, looked at the effect of non-pharmaceutical interventions, tried to characterize how effective these interventions were at controlling the epidemics in the 11 countries we considered. You can see the flags on the right. We tried to work out how many infections there were, and this is uh, still a hard question to answer because of the limited amount of testing that was occurring in February and in March and in April in Europe. And we tried to work out whether or not the epidemics were under control due to these interventions. Here's the model that underlies our work. This is a new model that we proposed. Critically, it's a semi-mechanistic model. So you'll see as I go through it from bottom to top, parts of the model are very statistical in nature. There are unknown parameters. It's a Bayesian model. We assign priors to those parameters. Some 
parts of the model are epidemiological and they take values that are given to us, handed to us by colleagues using different data sets, using different statistical methods. So I'll get to that in a second. At the bottom, we have the non-pharmaceutical invent interventions, not just lockdown, but also closure of schools, uh, social distancing, banning public events, etc. Those in our model parameterize, the non-pharmaceutical interventions parameterize the time-varying reproduction number, R of T, which itself modifies the basic reproduction number, R naught. The time-varying reproduction number, R of T, drives the infection process. Now, this is a, an epidemiological model at its heart. Infections drive future infections. How many? That's parameterized by the time-varying reproduction number, R of T. Now, when does one infection lead to new infections? That's characterized by the generation time, or uh, as we've written it here, the serial interval distribution between infections. Now, that distribution isn't something that we felt we were in a position to learn from the data that we observed. And the only data that this model takes in is deaths. We don't use case data. We weren't in a position to learn that, so we relied on estimates from colleagues at Imperial based on Chinese data sets, small in size, but ultimately pretty accurate in terms of the estimates that they obtained. We've gone back and we've checked them using much larger data sets. Similarly, a critical quantity is, while we model infections, how do we get from infections to deaths? The two things that we need are the distribution over time. How long does it take if you're infected with SARS-CoV-2, the virus, before you uh, unfortunately might die from COVID-19, the disease. So that's the symptoms to death distribution and the infection to symptoms distribution. We need to convolve both of those. And something that's still very controversial, the infection fatality ratio, what fraction of people infected end up dying at a population level. And again, we needed to take estimates of that quantity from uh, public, from reports and ultimately from published papers, um, most notably from a, a publication in The Lancet from Verity et al. Using those quantities, using epidemiological knowledge and modeling approaches, we wrap that together using a probabilistic programming language that's freely available and has a wide user base called STAN. And we put that into a Bayesian hierarchical statistical model. Here's what it looks like for one country. On the far left, we infer the number of infections. Remember, this isn't observed, but we observe our cases. Cases have very low ascertainment reporting, and you can see those down at the bottom starting around 23rd March. But infections had already, according to our estimates, peaked before that. They had peaked the day of lockdown. We have the daily number of deaths. Now, this is data. This is our model is fitting to that data. The uncertainty intervals here are just around the central estimates. So that's why the uncertainty intervals don't cover a lot of the data. And then finally, we have our inferences about the time varying reproduction number, R of T, over time. And we see a dramatic drop on the day of lockdown. And now this is, in some sense, because of how we've parameterized the model. And so I will come back to that assumption. But first, let me tell you about. The first lesson that we drew from this. So our work would not have been possible. We would not have been able to derive the estimates that we cared about from an epidemiological point of view without having relied on domain expertise and domain experts. In the world of artificial intelligence, we rely critically on experts, humans, to give us labeled data, right? When we train a classifier, we use labeled data. A human gave us those labels. But I would argue, although we've made great advances in black box machine learning methods that uh, do away with handcrafted feature engineering, there is still a real role to be played by experts, especially by scientific experts, whether they're social scientists or natural scientists, who have, through other scientific means, obtained lots and lots of knowledge about how things in the world work over the course of centuries. This information should be built into our models, whether that's in the form of a prior, and then we can update that 
given data, as we do with, in fact, the infection fatality ratio, or if that's just in the form of the actual part of the model, which is not a statistical component, but follows an epidemiological, in this case, component. Okay, after our Europe report, we went in a number of different directions. One of those was subnationally, focusing on Italy, the earliest, uh, one of the worst hit countries in Europe. Here, instead of using non-pharmaceutical interventions to parameterize R of T, we used mobility. How much do humans move around? This is measured by a number of different companies. We use the Google Community Mobility Reports. Uh, you can see the actual data here. You can see that uh, at baseline, 0%. That's what was happening in February. And then we can see dramatic drop-offs through March, April, and May with people stopping moving around. They're confined more or less to their homes because of the very strict lockdown in Italy. And we can see that that corresponds to the non-pharmaceutical interventions. That's in the upper right panel. Lockdown in red circle shows, corresponds around, uh, I think it's 11th of March, to the dramatic drop-off in mobility. Now, this works. It gives us a good fit to the data to the point at which we observe data. In our model, we make uh, various sorts of forecasts, not, not really forecasts, scenarios, how things might play out. And you can see that if, if you know what happened in Italy, uh, this scenario thank, thankfully did not play out. What this scenario shows is that if mobility returns to baseline, uh, returns to only 20% to baseline, sorry, even in that small return towards baseline, infections pick back up. The time-bearing reproduction number is now above one starting in the 4th of May, and that is when Italy opened up. That's why we chose that scenario, because we knew that Italy was opening up a little bit. And immediately, not immediately, there's a delay. 20 days after infections start to pick back up, deaths start to pick back up. That's not what happened. What happened in practice? Deaths continued to go down and down and down and down over the summer. Cases pick back up in mid-July, but I don't have a plot of that here. And then unfortunately, in the past weeks, deaths start to slowly pick back up as well. So how did we get it wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong is that mobility is a useful parameter, a covariate for understanding changes in RT in the first wave, pre-lockdown, during lockdown. But the relationship changes post-lockdown. So here's the second lesson. Uh, you've heard the uh, saying, uh, um, all models are wrong, some are useful. Uh, I would go a little bit further to explain what's useful about models. And now I'm talking about uh, statistical models in particular, models that we can improve and expand by making them more flexible or by changing how we uh, set them up. Models, I would argue, are imperfect maps of the world. Now, the focus in artificial intelligence is usually on improving some performance metric, lowering some loss function, raising our test accuracy. And that's, of course, important. It has real world implications. But to learn about the world, I would argue, we need to know where does the map not match reality? When we learn where does the map have a mismatch with reality, then we've learned something about reality. We've learned something about our models mismatch with the reality, and then we can improve our model. And so that's exactly what we have tried to do to try to understand mobility in the period of the between the two waves in Europe. And it's something that's an ongoing process to understand, well, what has changed? What were the mitigating factors? Was it the social distancing behaviors that people undertook themselves? Was it the fact that many things still remain closed, even as people started to move around? We don't ultimately know. Finally, a third lesson, use simulated data to check your models. This, I think, is uh, very obvious in some fields and almost unheard of in others. I think it's something that in artificial intelligence, we often don't appreciate. We just immediately run off to use maybe a benchmark data set, but real data. when simulating our own data, fitting our models to that data, and seeing how well our models recover, in this case, the truth, because we've set it up that way, can be very, very informative. Even more importantly for our setting, 
simulate data from the models. Well, that's one way to actually simulate data to check the models. Simulate data from the models before we fit them. So that's a prior predictive check. Simulate data from the models after fitting them and compare both of those to reality. Here's an example of that. Maybe we should parameterize our model using step changes. A non-pharmaceutical intervention comes in and suddenly R goes from being above one to below one, or that's on the left, top left, or top right. Maybe these uh, uh, changes were slowly changing over time. They had smooth impacts on R of T, people's behavior changed, and that's shown the infection curve in the lower right, or maybe it's a mixture of those. That's shown in the middle. And so the latent infections, which we can't observe, have different behaviors under those three different priors, parameterizations. If we now turn to deaths, deaths, remember, occur some probability about 15 to 25 days after the infection. Now here, because of the convolution of that probability distribution, we expect the curve of deaths to be very smooth. So this tells us, first of all, if we're only looking at death data, we might worry that we won't be able to disentangle the far left parameter from the far right parameter. On the other hand, if there's differences in timing, we might still have some hope. And so in the world of modeling and expanding those models to capture features of the data, the center is the most generic way of disentangling those two things. And that's something that we're trying to do by including both NPIs and mobility into our models. Okay, that is it. You heard my lessons. Thank you so much for listening. Code for all of our reports and papers is on our GitHub. We have an R package that makes it very easy to run the model, not just in the basic form I showed you, but a model that includes cases as well, a model that includes other types of observations that you might have, for example, seroprevalence surveys. Uh, usually I work not on COVID-19. Usually I don't work on statistical thinking for AI, but I work on statistical machine learning and AI for statistical thinking. And so that's a different talk or five different talks. Uh, but I hope that you will check out some of this other work. I think it's very exciting and hope that someday I'll return to that. Thank you so much.